Jim Rowan, how you going? It is the 9th of May, 2021. A eh, kind of cloudy, but not a bad day. Um, and Dontaku ended earlier in the week. So I'm going to talk about it because that's what I do here on this podcast is talk about New Japan. Have you noticed? Kind of my thing. Um, so, it actually might be a shorter one because uh, it's just these two shows. And, uh, well, 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 we'll get into it and see how far we get um, with some news about the future of New Japan uh, at the end of it. But night one of New Japan Pro Wrestling Don Taku took place on the 3rd of May in the Fukuoka International Center and opened with Master Wato, Tiger Mask, Hiroyoshi Tenzan, and Toru Yano versus Dick Togo, Taiji Ishimori, Yujiro Takahashi, and Evil. And um, this one ended when Ishimori hit a rubbish looking bloody cross on Tiger Mask for the win. Uh, and he's, I mean, at this stage, definitely done more than Wato to earn a title shot. And even even Yo, actually, in fairness, all Yo did was recover from knee surgery or whatever. Anyway, after this one, promo uh, from Tiger. He uh, recognized that his latest return was not particularly successful in the ring, but he reflects on a long career and he's not done yet. Wato asks why Bullet Club don't play fair. He thinks he could beat any one of them one-on-one, Ishimori in particular. Tenzan says Ishimori isn't worthy of, sorry, isn't worthy of the title, and Wato shouldn't let him get ahead in the title contender's race. And then Ishimori himself doesn't actually mention any of these guys. In his promo, he's more concerned with Taguchi's antics tomorrow. They're uh, scheduled to face off on the uh, Night 2 show. And then the second match on night one, Kazuchika Okada, Sho and Yo versus Yoshinobu Kanemaru, El Desperado, and Suzuki... Why have I got that backwards? I've got it the Japanese way. Suzuki Minoru! Uh, so there's no tape on Okada's back. Of course, this is his return. He's um, looking better. Looking much better. Uh, moving better. It's uh, promising. Seen him back in there. Of course, you know, it's just a tag match, and uh, his main opponent in here is Suzuki. So it's, you know, for the reputation Suzuki has, I I think generally he's pretty easy to work with because, um, yeah, I mean, he might slap you kind of hard, but that's that's something that fades away, you know. Your chest might be a bit red or your, your face, your cheek might be a bit red, or even a little bruised, but that kind of goes away after a couple of days. In terms of taking bumps, the kind of stuff that does not take a couple of days to go away, that's not something you have to worry about too much with Suzuki. So, um, it's, uh, yeah, a, a light return for Okada. Yo ends up winning this one with his direct drive, his, the new move he's returned with. It's a double underhook brain buster. He hits that on Kanemaru and gets the pinfall. After the match, Suzuki says his stable, Suzuki-gun, have, uh, they formed 10 years ago to the day. But they don't want to be celebrated. They're misfits, they're outcasts. Um, they're uh, outcast. Did I say cask? They're outcasts. Oh, it doesn't matter. You can't tell. Uh... A ragtag group of low lives, and they do anything they want. He declares his intentions for the world title, and he says he'll make those intentions clear against Okada tomorrow. Despi agrees that they are misfits, but they're also special in their own ways. And he goes on to say he thinks Yo might finally be starting to wake up, but it's too late. No one expects... (laughs) This is funny. Despi says, no one expects less of Yo than he does. And he's impressed with that direct drive, but he doesn't think Yo can pull it off against him. And then Yo comes in and he says, uh, he actually looks like he's about to fall asleep. Kind of confirming Desperado's comments 
Um, but when he does awake, he declares that he wants to contribute to the rejuvenation of the junior division uh, in his own way. And then Sho says that Yo has always been there with him and seeing him succeed motivates, uh, seeing Yo succeed motivates Sho and inspires him, which is all very sweet. And then Okada comes in. He says he's had plenty of time to heal up and there is still quite a bit of time until the Tokyo Dome. He can become, uh, or he can be the inspiration. No, oh, I've just written this wrong. He can be the inspiration the inspiring champion the world needs is what I meant. Let me just fix that up. He can be the in. Oh, geez. I've clicked something. I think I hit page down. Hold on. I've got to scroll. Night two, night one, the inspiring champion. Basically what Okada says was something along the lines of New Japan's not the same without him. He should be champion, and that's what he'll do. Okay. Next match is one we've seen a lot of, and uh, heard a lot about if you listened to my last podcast. Bushi, Sonata, Tetsuya Naito, and Shingo Takagi face off against the United Empire, Jeff Cobb, Aaron Hanare, Great Okan, and Will Ospreay. And the stuff between Ospreay and Shingo in this match, uh, it actually opens the match, and it's really, really good. Um... Is a good teaser for the match to come on the next night. Naito drags Khan around by his hair, which serves him right. He said he would cut it, apparently, and he didn't. But this one ends with Sonata catching Hanare with the Japanese leg roll... Japanese leg roll clutch for the pinfall victory. Uh, after the match, Osprey says he will neutralize Shingo's best weapon with... Some research from an old enemy. I don't know who he's referring to. And he, I think he meant an old enemy of his own. So who was an enemy of Osprey's? I mean, Zack Sabre Jr. Maybe. I mean, he's good at he's good at uh, neutralizing weapons. Anyway, Okan reminds. Us of the Empire's victories following their recent defeats. Of course, him going down to Naito, uh, one example. But he's kind of just saying, hey, look, don't just think about that. We've been beating him all all month. And then uh, Cobb says, oh, he's asking where Ibushi is. He thinks that Ibushi's scared of him. Hanari thinks that finish should be illegal because it doesn't hurt at all. And he wants another shot at Sonata. And then he also wants Ishii, and Jay White, and Goto, and more. But it's a list that Sonata is on. And then Naito enters. He says that he hasn't wrestled in Fukuoka since the 2019 G1 Climax. And he's grateful to be back. He continues that he and Takagi are the same age, and they had the same trainer, Animal Hamaguchi. So he will watch tomorrow night's match very closely. I guess kind of insinuating... That, um, you know, they're, they're on a similar level. If Shingo can do it, he can do it. That kind of thing. Which, I mean, you know, Naito's more than proven himself, particularly in comparison to Shingo. So, I guess maybe... Well, I suppose you could say that lately Naito's doubted himself a little bit. Just in, um, you know... He, in the matches with Empire, when Khan was getting the better of him earlier in the tour, it you know there was moments when Naito did look a little bit lost and um, unsure of himself. So it's possible that you know he definitely got a big win and, and a rather dominant win, in my opinion, over Great Khan in the singles match. But it's possible that some of that, you know, that he's that he's still kind of hiding some of those um, fears or, or, or just kind of uh, feelings of doubt behind this partial facade of uh, confidence. Um, but, you know, 
it's that's but that's the the fun thing about Nitro promos is that you do have to kind of read into them a little bit. He's he's kind of tricky with his words. He's an interesting cat. Um, was that the end of those promos? Yes, that brings us to the next match. So this was a match for the IWGP Tag Team Championship Challenge rights. Almost like a briefcase match. So uh, it was Zack Sabre Jr. versus Tangaloa. If Zack wins, he will win himself and Tai Chi the right to challenge for the IWGP Tag Team Championship. If Zack is defeated, he will lose the right to challenge the IWGP... Uh, actually, they didn't specify this very well. If it was that he can't challenge, or that they can't challenge for the IWGP Tag Team Championships ever again, or if it was just the current Gorillas of Destiny, uh, <laughs> Destiny, Gorillas of Destiny reign. I mean, it makes way more sense that it would just be against the Gorillas. Um, a because that's easier to enforce, and you wouldn't have to. You know, there's, there's really no reason to break that stipulation if Zack was to lose this match. Um, it just seemed... I mean, they're a good tag team, Zack and Taichi. The idea that they could never challenge for the tag team titles ever again just doesn't make any sense. So... It's not a good step when you think about it that way. Um, because... Because no one will believe it, kind of. You know, like, it, it's it sort of just makes you think, all right, well, it just... That further confirms that Zack's going to win. Because we already know that Zack's a much more accomplished singles wrestler than Tangaloa is. So, I don't know. Sometimes you go too far with a step, and, you know, it could be, well, if Zack Sabre Jr. wins, he gets to chop Tangaloa's head off. And you're kind of like, wow, Tangaloa really doesn't want to lose this match, I guess. But you can only suspend your disbelief so far. It kind of just makes you think, all right, well, either Tangalo is winning or well, actually, I don't know. I don't know what they would do in that situation. Not chop his head off, I imagine, which I guess is the point. I'm rambling. This match, Zack Sabre Jr., Tangalo. Um, he's dumb enough to want to grapple early, is Tangaloa. And that quickly earns him a bad arm. He does much better with his power striking. That allows him to keep a distance as well, which is what he wants. I mean, I don't think he went into this with much of a strategy. But um, especially given, yeah, he went straight in like, hey, yeah, let's, let's chain grapple Zack Sabre Jr., most dangerous grappler in the company, potentially. Um, but uh, that is the difference between them. He's, he's got... Uh, these these strikes that send Zack across the ring. Because even his power slams, even when, um, you know, Tangaloa would go for a power bomb or something like that, that would still sometimes end up uh, with him in a compromised position because Zack is so tricky and he just, now he's he's got a hold of you, he just kind of, you know, maneuvers his way around and grabs a limb or whatever he needs to do. So um, that was... Definitely the, the way forward for Tangaloa in this one is the strikes. Um, while Zack's strikes, on the other hand, affect Tangaloa very little. So um, it's in that sense, you know, if you were to kind of go back to the old days of, or even, I mean, s still sometimes currently the, the modern days of MMA, that classic striker versus grappler uh, dynamic. So, uh, oh, there is one... Um, a bit of a coup for Tangaloa, I suppose. The OJK, Operation Jado Killer, is the name of Tanga's crossface. And he does lock that on to Zack Sabre Jr. for a short time, and he looks really proud of it, which he should be, in fairness. I mean, that's um, getting, getting Zack down like that is, uh, even if it was only for a short time, commendable. He goes for, this is Tangaloa, of course, goes for ape shit, but... Pauses to taunt, and Zack makes him pay 
for that by dropping behind and rolling Tanger over into a crucifix pin, and that is the winning move. He pins him down with the crucifix. And uh, after the match, Zach picks up Tanger's title belt, gives it a kiss before throwing it back to the champion. He's won the match and has earned the right at a title shot. So the promo after, Tangaloa congratulates Zach. He says, today's Bullet Club Day. I suppose perhaps this is the day they were formed. Should we check it? I think I've got time to kill on this one, so let's check it. Bullet Club Wikipedia, where all the best information is stored. May 3, 2013. It's their anniversary. Happy Bullet Club Day, everyone, six days ago. Um, there you go. But anyway, Tangaloa says that he had fun in this match, and he will have fun defending the titles as well, which is kind of a weird promo from him. I mean, he's really happy. He's really happy about... And I mean, you know, look, in fairness... I'm not even having a go in kayfabe here that he should be angry that he lost. You know, he's a competitor. He lost this one. He didn't really have anything on the line. I mean, he's the champion. He needs to expect tough challenges. Um, and I'm sure if you got them in a candid moment, they both would admit that Zack Sabre Jr. and Tai Chi are very much worthy competitors uh, or challenges to their titles. But... Um, I, I say it was weird just in that, I, you know what it is? Tangelo is just still finding himself on the mic. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He, 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 he kind of, yeah, still finding himself is how I would put it. So he's tried something different here. He was just kind of really happy and almost talking in like a higher pitch voice. It, it, was, it was a bit strange. But it was whatever, you know, not something you need to go back and watch. Zach says he is a big, strong, scary boy, of course, relating uh, or referring to Tangaloa, and that maybe he could make something of himself if he didn't hang out with his moron brother. And then he starts talking about his vegan diet and his noodle body, and he's happy with the win, although he did want to submit Tangaloa, so um, he'll take it, but not what he wanted. The co-main event, the second from the top semi-main event, uh, Iron Fingers from Hell ladder match. Tai Chi versus Tamatonga. So this one's got a little more on the line. They both really seem to want these Iron Fingers. Tanga, or sorry, Tama Tonga, more so it seems out of spite than anything else. Although they did give him strange, not powers, they just made him a little nuts when he was wearing them. And then they've kind of abandoned that since. Like, tai, um, yeah, they've, they've kind of stopped doing that. But, because uh, Tai Chi went psycho when he got him back. Um, and then I don't remember that ever being a thing before. They just were, you know, almost like a brass knucks. You pull them out, you knock the guy out, the referee didn't see it, you make the pin. I don't remember it ever being something that had mystical powers, but... That's kind of where we are now, uh, or where we were before, and then I haven't seen it since. Anyway. The wrestler that claims the Iron Fingers that are inside a bag and hung above the ring owns them forever. That's the stipulation behind this one. Taichi versus Tamatonga. There's ladders set up all around ringside. Taichi's joined by Doki, and Tama is tailed by Jado. And uh, the Iron Fingers are actually shown to each competitor like a championship belt would be before the referee places it in the bag and it's raised high above the ring. And Tai Chi and Tama, as they have been for... <laughs> this feud's been going on forever. They meet in the center, they're throwing strikes, they circle the ring uh, after that and uh, both take possession of a letter. They clash in the center again with those. Tama's the first to attempt to reach the Iron Fingers and he gets pretty close, but his ladder's too short. There's two sizes of ladder in the... Um, that they have scattered around the ring there. Uh, so he decides he needs a taller ladder. He instead, So instead he, he sends Taichi into this one. 
<laughs> and then he forgets that there's no pinfalls, I guess, and makes a fool of himself pinning Tai Chi. But uh, that delay allows Tai Chi to counter. He drags Tamar outside. He sets a ladder up across the from the ring apron to the barricade. But whatever his attack was supposed to be, it doesn't work out. So they abandon the ladder there. He's still getting the better of Tamar, though. Uh, although, in fairness, Dogi's helping out. He interferes a couple of times. Um, and they're the first to start that, in fairness as well. You know, Jado hadn't interfered at all, and uh, Doki attacked Tama on the outside. So uh, that goes on. Taichi goes back into the ring. Tama recovers and tries to overtake Taichi on the ladder as he's trying to get up, but um, Taichi knocks him off and then leaps out at him, only to take a gun stun. Taiji leaping off the ladder and eating a gun stun out of nowhere. Um, but it's not one. It's didn't. It, it didn't look very good. And I was listening to the Japanese commentary for this one, though, because I, I watched it the night of. And um, the commentators didn't. It, it, it sounded to me that the commentators didn't even recognize that it was a gun stun. That it, it looked that bad. And then they kind of realized after a little while because Taiji was selling it. They're like, oh, I, I think that's what it was. Then Jado enters, and oh, and actually, no, before that, um, Doki springs in off the ropes to kick Tama down so that he can't use that to go up and claim the Iron Fingers. Jado enters and cracks Doki with the kendo stick, which at this point, as I said, it's, I mean, that's completely warranted at this point. Doki's interfered twice, at least. I think it might be even three times at this point. But then Jado takes it a step further and he tapes Tai Chi to the guardrail. So Tama has a clear run at the Iron Fingers until Zack runs out to stop him, and he, he ducks Jado's stick swing on his way out, and then he pushes the ladder over and he frees Taichi, helps him into the ring. So now Tangaloa gets down there, and he stops Taichi as he crawls up the ladder. Zack attacks Tanga, but uh, he cops an apeshit pile driver. And then um, Tangaloa tries to powerbomb Taichi into the ladder, but Doki stops him only to take the powerbomb himself. Although, Tangaloa doesn't powerbomb him into the ladder that was set up in the corner. He throws him over the top rope, through the ladder that was across from the apron to the barricade, and Doki lands on his freaking head. This was a hellish pump for poor, loyal servant Doki. That's, it's... It's it's one of the... I mean, I don't know. I've seen some crazy bumps. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to oversell it. But it was one of the craziest bumps I've seen in recent history. It looked really dangerous. Um, and I watched it a few times, I'll admit. The gorillas go for a magic killer on Tai Chi, but he fights them, he fights them both off. And then off come the pants. Rip. Jado cracks him in the back with a stick, but uh, Tai Chi just kind of cops it, turns around, fights off Jado. Tama stirs again, but Tai Chi choke slams him off the ladder. Call back to, uh, I, I, I'd suggest, probably a um, Taoe callback using the, the choke slam. And um, then, yeah, Tai Chi goes back to the ladder, but this time, Tama strikes him with the small ladder to stop him. And then he fetches the... Uh, Tama fetches a table. He brings that into the ring. He peels Tai Chi off the ladder in a, into a, a powerbomb position. But he loses balance and Tai Chi hooks back onto the ladder. So now they're, they're fighting from each side of the ladder with the... Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're just under the, the bag above, the iron fingers... But then Tama goes for the gun stun off the ladder. Tai Chi holds on and Tama just sends himself through the table. What a dope. I did notice under the table it had NJPW in black marker. On, like in, written in black marker under the table. Like your mum's Tupperware. Don't lose this. It's got our name on it. Uh, and that leaves Tai Chi alone on the ladder to reach the bag. Everyone else is kind of knocked themselves out so... He gets up there, he reaches the bag, he pulls out the iron fingers, and he wins the match, but more importantly, claims 
his precious gift from Iska back for good. And he puts them on, but he doesn't go crazy. So, and then for some reason he hands it to the referee, Marty Asami, that like he wants to be presented them. So Marty Asami squats down and then, you know, um, kind of, I guess in a more honored fashion, just kind of hands them over to Taichi and then Taichi accepts it. Um, I don't know, that might be a bit of a cultural thing, but Taichi takes the mic. He says, it's done, it's over. He asks that New Japan play Iska's music, and they do, which is a good theme. I like it. Backstage, Tama crawls in. He slowly gets up and leaves without a word. Oh, sorry, yeah. No, I'm just reading through this. That was it in the ring. Taichi, um... No, he must cover it in the back. But uh, basically, Taichi's saying that that's it. He's not going to... Um, he's kind of retiring the Iron Fingers. But, um, yeah, anyway. So backstage, uh, Tama, he crawls into the press area. He slowly gets up, but then he... Yeah, he leaves without a word, and I considered it one of his better promos. Zack and Doki, who somehow... Uh, Doki is still alive, by the way. They congratulate Tai Chi backstage. Tai Chi thanks them for having his back, and he's glad that they are now set for a tag title match. Zack suggests they go for the six-man titles as well, and Doki's pumped about that. Tai Chi asks Doki to call an ambulance for the scratch on his arm, which is pretty bad. It like goes, it's probably like six inches long from his biceps down past his elbow. And I don't remember exactly where he got that from, but uh, Zach's like, hey, nah, come on, some drinks all sorted out, let's go out for a drink. And that reminds Taichi that there aren't any Zemas out for him. And he just kind of blames and berates the audience behind the cameras for them not having Zemas there to present him. Um, of course, he certainly seemed to consider the Iron Fingers uh, as good as a title win. I mean, for this whole time, really, he's been more interested in the the Iron Fingers than the uh, tag titles. So it means more than a title to him. So fair play that he would want a, a uh, yeah, Zima presentation. Okay, and then the main event. I was looking forward to this one. Jay White and Hiroshi Tanahashi, they have a, a cool little title signature before the entrances for the Openweight Championship. Um, unfortunately, this result was spoiled for me. I do try to avoid the spoilers. I don't always watch this stuff as it happens. I think um, I watched all of the matches on the night, but then it got a bit late and I thought um, I'll save the main event and I'll watch it tomorrow. It'll give me something to look forward to after work. And um, yeah, unfortunately, I clicked on the wrong thing and oh, I think it was YouTube that spoiled it. I was looking up something else and I just saw like the... the um, Thumbnail of Zach, uh, sorry, not Zach, Jay White holding the title. Oh no, I spoiled it for you. Oh geez, oh well. Um, so this is Tanahashi's second defense of the title. They uh, come out to the ring, they complete their obligatory pose down. Tanahashi's in remarkably better shape than the last time Jay saw him. Of course, this is Jay's return to the New Japan ring. He hasn't been a part of the Dontaku tour. Um, until, uh, yeah, this is it. This is his first time back. But, um, yeah, Tanahashi's looking great, prompting titillated cries of Sugoi! Sugoi! from Yano on commentary, which I think means it's kind of just like a... I think it, it's kind of a wow. It means wow. It's pretty dynamic in its use. You can kind of use it for amazing or oh my gosh or yeah i think it's kind of pretty direct translation of wow uh i learned that when i was over there that impressed them because that's kind of an out of nowhere one that's not something that you know you watch a youtube video what words do i need when i'm in japan or you read a handbook how do i ask for where the toilet is like none of them would tell you what sugoi is so Pro tip for anyone traveling to Japan, hopefully not soon, 
Sugoi. Because it's, it's, you know, you think about it, wow. Wow's a, a pretty useful word. Just kind of a reactionary kind of thing. Because you can use it sad, like something bad happens. Oh, Sugoi. Or uh, something great happens. Or you're doing, uh, you know, someone's trying to show you something and, you know, you're, you're part of like a a little group and you're struggling to communicate with them exactly. You throw out a Sugoi and they're like, ah, oh, wow, that's cool. He knows a weird word. Or she, if you're listening to this and of the other sort. But, um, yes, by the way, can't tell you for a fact that I'm using that word correctly. So use at your own risk. Anyway. That was Yano's reaction on commentary to the sight of Tanahashi's abs. But then the match starts, white stalls and trash talks, and not long before he starts going after Tanahashi's bad knee, Tanahashi makes a comeback, but white attacks his eyes as he attempts the cloverleaf. Tanahashi's looking for the high fly flow on the outside, but Jay catches uh, him before he can leap. He wraps Tana's leg around the ring post, and uh, the champion works back toward it, though. Um, the high fly flow, that is. He lands a huge one to the outside, but his knee didn't enjoy it. Then they return to the ring. The grappling steps up. Jay takes the advantage. He locks the JTL in right in the middle. Tanashi manages to drag himself to the ropes, but he looks ill with pain once, he, once the, the hold is broken. He still manages a straight jacket German suplex, a classic of his, that earns a two count, a close two count, and um, the fans are loudly behind Tanahashi. There's a sling blade that lands, and Gato's knocked off the apron um, because he's kind of sensing Tanahashi getting some momentum. He goes up for the high fly flow. It's nearly counted into a blade runner. So Jay jumped up on his feet and and nearly catched him uh, just straight into the blade runner, but then Tanahashi resists that, and of course... Jay White always two steps ahead. Tanahashi's resistance is then turned into another JTO. He kind of goes with him. Um, that's kind of... And I mean, that's 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 grappling. Like uh, in jiu-jitsu, my coach is always saying, you, you, you give them what they want and make them pay for it. If they're tr- resisting and pulling away, it's like, okay, let's go that way then. If they're coming at you, it's like, okay, you want to do that? Come this way then, I'll make it... Work for me. And that's what Jay White does so well. The um, uh, Tanashi does get out of that one too, though. He actually this time has to basically carry Jay to the ropes uh, with his legs. Um, and then the referee kind of just... Dis- well, I say the referee distracts Jay, but not really. Jay's kind of getting in the referee's face. He cops a dragon screw to slow him down a touch, but Tanashi knows he won't get many more chances, so he hobbles up toward Jay, um, but then takes uh, a dragon screw back and wails in pain. Tanahashi fights off another JTO, but the dragon screws keep coming. Um, but even just with these few moves Jay's taken, he's already limping a bit himself. Because um, I suppose, you know, a dragon screw from anybody is one thing. A dragon screw from the master Tanahashi, you know, um, it's uh, he's uh, he's he's the king of it now. Now that Muto's on the uh, well, they're both on the downswing in fairness, but you know what I mean. Tanahashi, though, I mean Jay's limp and Tanahashi's struggling to stand, so Jay's starting to taunt him. And uh, he's, he's taunting him with his own phrases, like, never give up, never get tired, you know. Remember this, Tanahashi, you're not supposed to get tired. And um, really trying to break him down mentally. There was a point where he even let Tanahashi lift up his leg just because he's moving, just because Tanahashi's moving so slowly. And he just knocks him down with a forearm. Um, of course, like, Tanahashi would be going for the dragon screw, for example. And Jay almost, like, lets him get there and just is treating him like he's pathetic and just knocks him off him. 
But Tanahashi bites back with a lariat, and um, I mean, at this stage, it still feels like he's um, just delaying the inevitable, but he manages to land another dragon screw. He looks for the sling blade, but has to counter a blade runner that comes up out of nowhere. Tanahashi fires up, though. He lands the sling blade. He goes back up top. Jay turns around and takes the high fly flow directly to the chest. Tanahashi goes up again. He comes down this time on Jay White's knees, and it's now Jay White, the one that's wailing in pain. Tanahashi's unsteady on his feet, but he signals the end. He straps on the Texas Cloverleaf, and Gato, of course, once again, sensing that Jay's in a lot of trouble, jumps up on the apron to distract the referee, and Jay taps out. But the referee doesn't see it. He's looking at Gato. Now, the thing here is, and it is a, a nuance, but Jay did look up from the mat and see Gato there and he saw where the referee was and then he started tapping profusely he started you know tapped the mat a couple times and then he started tapping Tanahashi on the uh well rear end kind of on the thigh and so when I watched this back and uh, heard the Kevin Kelly's uh commentary because I watched this match back a second time and um Kelly pointed out the same thing. I noticed it and Kelly noticed it. Did Jay White actually need to tap out or was he kind of just using the situation and tricking Tanahashi a bit to get him to release the hole? Because it's not as if he's not in pain, but it's just not necessarily if the referee was watching him and it meant the end of the match, would he still have tapped out? Because he's smart, he's devious, and he's kind of got no shame. So the idea that Tanahashi can tell him oh, but you tapped out, he can go, whatever, who's got the title? And he'd be quite fine with that, Jay White. So, um, I don't know, it's just a neat little uh, a neat little detail that's worth pointing out. But anyway, so Tanashi does release the hold, although it sort of seems like he, even though Tanashi's back's turned to it, it, I don't know, he probably overheard it. It sounded like he knew what was going on and um, it would just seem that way. So he goes over to Gato. He gives him a dragon screw. But, of course, Gato's already done his job in breaking the hold. So Tana goes to put the clover leaf on again, only to nearly fall to a cradle. And then White tries a backslide with, the, with his feet up on the ropes, the way he beat Ibushi for the briefcase. But Tana actually kicks out. Red Shoes didn't see it. He had to kick out. Um, and then they... Both attempt a couple big moves in desperation, but they're, they're both pretty slowed down at this point, and it's it's kind of counter, counter, Blade Runner out of nowhere. And it actually was the same thing. The resistance I talked about earlier. Jay um, Tanashi had him in some kind of a... I think it was a full Nelson hold, and Jay's reaching for the... reaching for the ropes, reaching for the ropes, and then suddenly he just leans back into Tanahashi, knocks him off balance, grabs his neck, bang, Blade Runner. So again, he's he's using Tanahashi's resistance against him. Um, and I really like those little details. It's it's just a little element of realism um, to the grappling. So And Jay's wonderful at that stuff. That's why he's one of my favorites. And um, that's having said that, I, I do believe on the Duntaku uh, tour podcast I did last time, that I predicted Jay uh, losing this match. He wins, of course, if I didn't make that clear. He hits the Blade Runner. That's the three count. He wins the title. Um, it makes sense in hindsight now that, you know... Because one thing I did say last time was I don't know how they get to Jay White versus Osprey. They're both kind of similar heels it's not that it's not a fun match they wouldn't want to see just doesn't really make sense this time in the title picture so this way um i think if they were to do it this way jay white winning uh immediately adds prestige to the never open weight championship because he's a true world title contender and him 
uh, winning it over uh, Tanahashi, who's kind of not sure about this title or, or not feeling he's earned it or, or, or just not kind of, you know, sure about it all. Um, it just creates this, you know, it, it gives makes Tanahashi the one chasing it again. Um, so it can just mean that they have a, a little series. Tanahashi gets his win back. The, he, he wins it back. It's a, it's a big, fun victory for everyone. They want to see Tanahashi beat Jay White because he's such a prick. And it, at the same time, has added prestige to that title. And now it com- kind of completes that feeling of Tanahashi feeling uh, worthy of it and, and, and um, happy with it, happy with wearing it around his waist. And... Here we go. Never title means something now. So, not that it didn't before, but, you know, I mean, Shingo's reign was awesome. But, yeah, um, that's that's my, that's my next prediction, my next booking prediction. So, if you wanted that to happen, if, if you heard what I've just said and thought, that sounds good, I'd like to see that. Well, I'm sorry, because most of my predictions don't work out, so I'm sorry to have ruined that for you, but uh, probably won't happen now. Uh, anyway, so the promos here. Jay White lies in the ring for quite a while after Suji helps his mentor from the ring. The audience are uh, polite enough to applaud, but he shushes them. He says their applause is insulting. He calls out after Tanahashi. He's like, uh, never mind, never quit, never give up. Never mind this belt because it's not yours anymore, and that's because you quit. You should quit for good, you should retire. Joe White calls himself the real belt collector, and if anyone wants to dispute that, you know where to find him. <coughs> Can you make a... <coughs> and he declares himself the first ever quadruple crown champion. Backstage, Tanahashi's crawling into the press area. He lies down on the cold concrete. This is the absolute worst, he says. He has lost count of the amount of times he's lost to Jay. This is what the passing of time looks like. He will try again. He has to. It's always heartbreaking when Tanahashi's sad. Then Jay White comes in. He's welcomed to the champion's table by Gato's applause. He compares Tanahashi to Ibushi. They're both frauds. They lie in their mottos, uh, which is true. He talks about how, you know, Ibushi says he would never give up. He will never lose. And he freaking lost, so... I mean, yeah, it's <laughs> you don't like him for pointing it out, but it's he's right. And then Jay talks about being young and wanting to drive diggers on a construction site. That was his dream job when he was back in Stillwater in Auckland. He calls out to David Finley for beating him in the New Japan Cup. He wants to face him next, which is a red panty night for Finley. He'd be jumping off his couch for that. Big title match. Um... Which, I mean, I already knew that and I started talking about Tanahashi. I guess, you know, I mean, Finley's not going to win it, surely. Would they do all this to just put the title on Finley? I don't think so. I don't want to see it. As good a match as they had last time. No thanks. Okay. Night two. That was it for night one. A good show overall. Um, Because the main event was very good. And the other matches were just uh, what we've come to expect, really. Nothing wrong with them. We're still in the Fukuoka International Center on the 4th of May for the second night of New Japan Dontaku. But this one opens with the chairman, Shugabayashi. He's in the ring. He's making an announcement. He says, Two wrestlers have COVID-19 symptoms, and so they will not be appearing tonight. The... Matches changed. Well, it was basically everyone removed from a single match that happened last night. Okada Show and Yo versus Kanemaru Desperado and Minoru Suzuki. Um, so on this card, it was supposed to be Okada and Show versus Kanemaru and Suzuki. And of course, the biggest change to the card as a result of this is the junior title match. Yo challenging Desperado. So both of those matches are off and they um, 
Well, 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 we'll go through what the changes end up being. But yeah, that's that was disappointing. The the title match, the junior title match, the co-main event's off. So the opener was Doki, Zack Sabre Jr. and Taichi versus Tamatonga, Tangaloa and Jado. Still happening for the time being. Kelly reports that the Iron Fingers will be encased in cement and never seen again. I've no issue with that. Doki's right shoulder is heavily taped up. I guess that took the brunt of his fall onto the ladder the night before. But um, anyway, this is a pretty standard match between these guys. We've seen it a dozen times before, just in the last month. Uh, Zack picks up the win, taking out the gorillas on his own and then submitting Jado. And he, when uh, his opponents are leaving, Zack grabs the mic. He tells them to hold up in Japanese. And then he passes the mic to Taichi. He says, I'm not too good at Japanese. I'll, I'll let Taichi talk from here. But he says all of that in Japanese. And the Japanese commentators are impressed with his pronunciation. So, um, very babyface move of Zach here. They're, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to say they've turned babyface, but they've certainly um, been... Whilst not changing who they are or how they act, they've, they've just tweaked certain things to be more appealing and be baby faces in this particular feud. Just it, just kind of interesting how they do that. But anyway, so yeah, Taichi takes the microphone and he says, uh, Hey Bozo Club! I've taken back the Iron Fingers, and now I want to settle this once and for all by taking the titles. Um, and backstage, Tangaloa says he's not having fun anymore. And that's all they say. They all leave after that. But Zach comes in. He says it's about time they earn the right to challenge. Taichi congratulates his teammates on uh, their contribution toward their position now. He looks forward to the match happening as soon as possible. He doesn't care if there's fans there or not. They just want to make the match happen on the next show available. So, um, the match after that was amended. It became Taiji Ishimori and Yujiro Takahashi against Master Wato and Hiroyoshi Tenzan. So, they split up. There was a 10-man tag that was third from the top on the original card. And they turn that match into a six-man. And, uh, of course, this is the uh, other portion that was removed for it, the, these four guys. So it's a good test for Wado because he should get a decent run here in this match. And um, not from the off, however, because Tenzan pushes him out and says, I want to start with Yujiro. But uh, he, he has Yujiro in trouble, actually. Ishimori has to break up an Anacon device. Then Tenzan tags in Wato, who gets the better of Ishimori at first, but after some help from Yujiro and a few stiff strikes, a jumping knee, that knocks Wato silly. And then uh, that follows, uh, or following that, is a bloody cross. And Taiji pins Wato to the mat, dismissing his claims at being a title contender as a result. And um, kind of a surprising... I mean, yeah, it's 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 a it's a result of more consequence than they would generally allow for on um, in a match like this. Although it is on a big show, Dontaku is one of the biggest shows of the year. But still, um, there's a there's obviously a, a feud very much underway here between them. Backstage, Wado says he'll continue to target Ishimori, and Tenzan tells him to believe in himself. Ishimori thinks Wato is overlooking the basics. He says, it's too early for you, moron. I keep trying to pause it because there's a helicopter flying around. Someone on the run, perhaps. Try not to, you know, have that affect the podcast as much as possible. Though I do have to work on stepping up the quality of this thing, I think, when I get the time. Anyway... Um, here's another match we're used to seeing. Jeff Cobb, Harren Hanare, and Great Khan. Well, it's slightly altered, I guess. 
versus Bushi Sonata and Tetsuya Naito, altered for obvious reasons. The uh, two missing parties in this one are in the main event, but um, it doesn't change much about the match. Cobb beats Ibushi because that's what always happens, uh, though this time he used a Kamigoye. Um, he doesn't he, he doesn't pin after the Kamigoye, though. He just hits that as a clear message to Ibushi, and then he hits the tour of the islands. Um, and after the match... Bushi, he says he's been beaten by Cobb in the Empire for a month, but he's learned a lot. He'll try and get back into the title picture. Naito admits that they've not been very successful against the Empire during the tour, but he looks ahead to his own path toward the Tokyo Dome. Hanari talks about his rage, moving him up the ranks just in one month since his uh, turn. And then Cobb wonders where Bushi is. He's he thinks he's uh, putting this match off by uh, running away from Cobb. Cobb wants to know when and where it'll happen, and he's going to win with a Cobagoye. Okan heard that LIJ were the top faction last year, but where are they now? Because the Empire have crushed them this year. And uh, what became the co main event? Rusuke Taguchi, Taguchi, Rusuke Taguchi, Toru Yano, Hiroyoshi, no, just Hiroshi Tanahashi, whoops, messed up everyone's name, versus Dick Togo, Evil and Jay White, and um, yeah, like I said earlier, this is the, was going to be a 10 man, it turned into a 6 man, and instead of it being the fallout of Jay and Tana, it was just more rubbish from Yano, he's still got the hood, um, for extra goofiness, we've got Taguchi added to it. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, they just kind of did the whole Yano, Dick Togo, an evil thing with the hoods and the low blows. Um, Tanashi did help with the finish. He put the hood on Togo while Togo low blowed him and evil at the same time. And then he rolled up Togo and that was the victory. I guess it's fair to say that Jay White and Tanahashi probably a bit... Well, actually, I don't know how much of an excuse Jay White has, but Tanahashi's sore. He's had a long tour and then a big match last night, but, yeah, I don't know. Gee, it wasn't a very... wasn't much of a warm-up for the main event. But afterwards, uh, White recalls that this belt... Um, it was representative of a division of tough guys and fighting spirit, but he's going to change all that. He's going to make a mockery of all of that because that style didn't get any of them anywhere and look how far white style has gotten him once again very good point think about it who were the guys that made that proper never division i mean you go back to recently shingo kind of brought it back a little bit he's not been world champion yet i mean he's about to get his opportunity but I think he's really referring to the likes of Shibata. He was never heavyweight champion. Ishii, never heavyweight champion. Goto, never heavyweight champion. Honma, never heavyweight champion. Nagata was. Nagata was heavyweight champion. He was part of that. Makabe was. And he was part of that. But still, it's, um, you know, a lot of the guys. I mean, Ishii, I think Ishii's the one that's held it the most times. Or I think Ishii and Goto. Uh, really close or even with like 10 reigns or something like that um, but yeah you know not to say they aren't great wrestlers but it's like it's an argument that can be made it's 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 you know you can't say Jay White's wrong necessarily you know um, he's he's certainly had a lot of success he's a quadruple champion uh, quadruple crown champion champion and he's only what you know 30 29 i think he's still in this way 28 and you know those guys are more like 48 and they haven't won um well they haven't won the big one they actually have won the other ones but anyway it's um it's just it's just a heel being a heel but you kind of like i hate it but he's kind of right um, and again, I, I was talking before about the, the future of this title. Um, this is great. You know, Jay White, um, 
is making a mockery of the title on purpose, Tanahashi comes back to save it. I mean, that's perfect. Uh, and you know what would actually make it even more perfect? That Jay White destroys David Finlay and makes him irrelevant. And then Tanahashi gets his title shot. <laughs> uh, no, I don't mean to hate on Finlay. He did impress me in the New Japan Cup. Um, I wish him the best. But um, I hope he's... Well, actually, he hasn't, he's not had time off. He's wrestling for uh, Impact, isn't he? I've not been keeping up with that. I think they've still got the titles. I don't know. Him in uh, Juice. But it's going to be a while since we, until we see him, just with the uh, uncertainty of Japan at the moment. More to come on that. But back to these promos after the um, six-man tag. So Tanahashi, he talks about that situation, about the uh, uncertain future, about the wrestlers missing from this card and the measures taken. Um, quite the diplomat he is. But then, uh, talking about himself, he, he used this tour to get into great shape and... Now he'll go into the next tour already in shape. The title was hiding his gut, and now that he's ready to wear the title, the title's gone, which he kind of laughs to himself about now, having been distraught about it last night. Not to say he's still not heard about it, but um, he can he can crack a smile about it now. Laughing at himself, of course, you know, about just uh, the situation. He calls it ironic. But uh, let's get to the big one. The IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. Shingo Takagi challenging Will Ospreay. I don't know if they changed the signature before the entrances, the World Championship signature. Um, I just, I thought it, I don't know, it looked better. Maybe they cut a little bit out of it. I think they should cut the Legacy and Evolution title screen out of it. I think that's unnecessary. But... Um, I do want to make the point, there's still, there's still people saying, oh, it lost, I just can't believe they destroyed the legacy of the Intercontinental title and the heavyweight title. Like, if the title screen was a one-off, and um, they only did it for that first match between Osprey and Ibushi, and then from then on, they just did, uh, like, so at the end of this, um, uh, at the end of this video that they play the signature, they had Ibushi there as the first world champion, right? But they still had all of the, you know, history of the heavyweight and intercontinental championships represented before that. Um, if they dropped that history part of the signature and just started doing first champion second champion third champion then i'd get it okay yeah they they are ignoring the past now but how can you say that they are now that they're clearly this is now what they're doing they've got the history of the heavyweight and intercontinental title belts played before every match the way they always did previously um not in the same way with like every champion. And I will admit, I do miss that. And you know what? They could have still done that if they just dropped the Intercontinental title. And for some reason, there's a lot of people that just have this, um, you know, I don't know, they love this Intercontinental title for some reason. I just don't have the same attachment to it. I kind of wish they just dropped that from it. I don't think it needs to be a part of this World Championships history. And... You know, any significant intercontinental champion also won the world championship, so it just it just waters it down. I would rather they had the same opening signature with every heavyweight champion, and then just continue it um, with you know just do some kind of little I don't know, even just like just put at the top. IWGP heavyweight champions. Number one, number two, number three. Blah, 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 blah. And then when it gets to Ibushi, you go, whatever it was, X number heavyweight champion. And then the next one is first world heavyweight champion. And it just continues the lineage on as if, almost as if nothing ever happened, just with a new title at the top. World heavyweight champion now. First of that. And just continue. 
So I don't know how much of this is reactionary. I don't know if they planned from the beginning to always make, you know, this, um, make sure that the intercontinental title and the world title were heavily represented and uh, the legacy was continued. I mean, I have to imagine it, they, it doesn't make any sense that they would just drop it all. But I wonder, I wonder if just with the intercontinental title, they thought, ah, oh, people are really reacting to this, we better include it. And I just think, I mean, please, if you disagree, please comment below. I want to have the conversation. What? Give me one champion that was intercontinental title, that held the intercontinental title, that didn't hold the world title, and we need them in this opening signature because the intercontinental title was that important. Like who? Nakamura is the one that made it important because they wanted Tanahashi to be the champion, the real champion. And Nakamura, you know, also was champion and could headline shows with this championship. But he was already a heavyweight champion. He was heavyweight champion well before he was intercontinental. He was well, he was heavyweight champion well before the intercontinental championship even existed. And then the next one that had a real attachment to it was Naito. Those were the two with the cool stories with the Intercontinental title. I mean, there, um, there was probably a few in between as well. But it just, I mean, like Jericho, that's a cool one. But, you know, Jericho is not worthy of being world champion. He's not worthy of being heavyweight cha- IWGP heavyweight champion. No, not in this company, at least. Not for what you need to be champion in this company at this at this time, in this era. I just, I just, I don't know. I'd have been happy to just drop it. Just drop the friggin' Intercontinental title. Actually, it goes back to my theory that they should have merged it with the US Championship. That's the one that needs a bump. And that's what started the Intercontinental title, right? There was It was supposed to be the traveling champion. Because, uh, you know, MVP won it early on, you know, defended it in the United States. That would have made more sense to me. And then, you know, Nakamura is already over there as, you know, he's a, he's a champion in the United States. Or I don't know if he's champion. He's, he's wrestling in the United States. And um, that would kind of become a cool, th- like, you know, because I don't think Nakamura is moving back to Japan. So not that they should make decisions based on if Nakamura comes back or not. But, you know, if he did, then you've got a cool little program there. He's like, oh, really? This is the, the new version of, of my title, the Intercontinental title. All right, well, I want to be US champion then. You know, this is the, the, the home I've adopted, and I'm going to take that title off you, Moxley. Whatever. Anyway, it's all happened now. My point when I, begin, when I began this rant was just, how can you say that they've destroyed the... Or how can you say they're ignoring history when they're showing you the history of both titles before every world championship match? All right, that's it. Shut up about it. Okay, let's talk about the match, shall we? This one was not spoiled for me. And uh, I also watched this one twice, the second time this morning. Uh, And I'll probably watch it again. This is Osprey's first defense in their fourth meeting. He he and Shingo Takagi. Kelly reports that the belt is 13 pounds and 14 millimeters thick. Pretty big. Pretty, pretty big. Uh, the usual chain wrestling kicks things off. It's all very sharp, if not inspired. The other members of the Empire are standing around the ring, but they don't get involved, though their presence does distract Shingo for a moment at the uh, time Osprey needs it early. He takes a table from the timekeeper, while unbeknownst to him, Shingo's fetching his own table from under the ring. So he wasn't ready for that Osprey, and Shingo gets the better of their table clash, and then he sets up both tables parallel to the apron. They tussle to send each other through them, but end up back in the ring where the match enters its second phase. Osprey on top for most of it. He reaches the point of attempting a Stormbreaker, but Shingo throws him off. There's a Kushida hoverboard Kimura that impresses Kelly, though Osprey goes for the left arm with it, which I didn't think was the pumping bomber arm. Uh, and that's something that Osprey in the promos earlier 
specifically noted that he was looking for a strategy to counter. If you mention, uh, if you remember, it was um, it was just last night's promos. Um, he said, uh, uh, "Help from an old enemy." Still don't know what that is. Either way, um, Shingo continues to sell the arm very well, uh, but then he goes on to prove me right with the pumping bomber. He does it with the right arm, uh, only that only to begin a series of counters between them. It doesn't land. Uh, Osprey then attempts an Oz cutter, but uh, the distance that he needs for that and that is created is all Shingo needs to counter and begin a comeback of his own power moves. But then there's a, a shooting star press that lands after a struggle on the top turnbuckle, and Osprey rolls Shingo onto the tables to set things up. He's gonna send him through the tables with a move off the top rope, probably another shooting star press. We've seen that before. But um, Shingo gets up on the apron, he pulls him down, they have a tussle. Eventually, Shingo wins out, hits a maid in Japan, sending them both through both tables, cuts Osprey's back open, and when Osprey finally returns to the ring, he eats another of the same move right in the center and right on top of his head. And that gives him a two count uh, for Shingo at about the 30 minute mark. And this is when it really picks up. Third phase, throwing everything at each other. Ozcutter lands for two. Shingo ducks the hidden blade and catches an Ozcutter. Hits a GTR. Shingo strikes with a left-armed lariat and then goes for the right-arm pumping bomber. But Osprey flips and lands on his feet. And then goes for an Ozcutter at the ropes. And that attempt is matched with a cutter out of the air from Shingo. And then he flattens Osprey with a pumping bomber, but that only gets a two count. And they just, it's back and forth. They can't keep each other down. There's a hidden blade that lands, but when Osprey goes for the pin, he doesn't, he's kind of, he's quite exhausted. He doesn't realize that Shingo's arm is under the bottom rope, but Red Shoes does. So the pin's broken. There's a pop-up DVD from Shingo. And then there's another Stormbreaker that's reversed into a jumping knee from Osprey. There's elbows back and forth. They clash with headbutts. Shingo attempts the last of the dragon again, but Osprey pulls out a Rainmaker as his counter, nails it, and then he lines up the hidden blade, nails it, and then he finishes Shingo with a Stormbreaker for the victory to defend the World Championship in a quite phenomenal match. One of the best matches of the year so far. Uh, I'm sure it'll hold up for the rest of the year too. Um... Damn, Shingo is on this level. And at the same time, uh, gee, so is Will Ospreay. I mean, not really a proven champion, of course. This is, he was never heavyweight champion before. He's world champion now. He's had two great matches um, in, well, not in his reign, but, you know, won with a great match, is now defended with a great match, um, is definitely on this level, you know. I mean, the promos could use some work, but still, um, he's getting there. He's better. Speaking of promos, Osprey thanks Shingo for being a stepping stone. He said the card changing didn't matter. Everyone paid to see him and the Empire. His destiny is the world heavyweight uh, is as world heavyweight champion. That's all he cares about. Alongside the United Empire, he looks ahead to his match with Okada. I imagine a confrontation here was probably likely, um, if not for the circumstances. But so we can mention Okada without risking having to get in his face um of course a reminder okada being one of the guys pulled from the show as a result of the the covid uh, results a couple of people they didn't mention who it was just a couple of people from that match uh, had symptoms so they they pulled them all from the show because they worked together um and then okan takes the mic and he, he doesn't translate he just he does his own promo he predicts luxuries and riches for the empire as well as the execution of Okada in the Tokyo Dome. Backstage, Shingo, he, he overhears Osprey, he hears him on the mic in the ring. He asks Suji if it's true, if he was really beaten, which he responds yes. He said he can't, Shingo says he can't remember anything beyond the halfway point. But this is very embarrassing and upsetting, uh, though he is still alive and his soul still burns. So Suji helps him out from the press area there 
And then Osprey comes back, entering in his pink robe to his table of Zemas. He says his back is broken, but he still carries his company on it. He tells the boys to have a drink with him, and then tells Hanare with a chuckle not to chug it this time. And Hanare looks kind of like he doesn't know what to do with it if he's not going to scull it, but he has a sip. Um, and then uh, they all go off. They didn't do too much of a promo. But then the news that came out after this, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, on Friday, May 7th, the Japanese government announced an extension to the state of emergency currently in place in Tokyo and other prefectures, it includes Osaka, I think. Um, New Japan Pro Wrestling has arrived at the decision to postpone the Wrestle Glam Slam events in Yokohama Stadium and the Tokyo Dome, which were scheduled for the 15th of May and the 29th of May. So new dates for both events will um, be finalized in future. More information will come as it becomes available, which is very disappointing. Grand Slam's off. Um, Dominion has to be in doubt as well. I mean, that's in a month's time. Um, Yeah, what a shame. I was looking forward to that next week. But... Well, what are you going to do? Uh, Well, actually, I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be releasing a bunch of historical podcasts because there's no New Japan now for probably... I mean, if even if Dominion's on, I mean, that's what, one, two, three, four weeks away? So if you're enjoying my historical podcasts, strap yourself in. That's what I'm going to be doing. And I'm looking forward to it too. I really like doing the historical stuff. Um, it's just that the current New Japan doesn't give me too much of a break to go back and focus on it. So, um, and I like I like that there's going to be a big block of it because it makes it a bit easier to uh, remember where you're up to um, and stay in the moment, you know, so I can keep a, a, a decent line of continuity when I'm telling the stories from back in 2007. So, yeah, really enjoying those. Um, But uh, that's it for this one. We we had... Actually, I'll say this as well, just on the the card. I think it was five matches on this card. One, two, three, four, five, yeah. I don't know, I kind of liked it. I wouldn't even mind if they went... Uh, you know, to four matches. Um, I just don't think these events... I mean, okay, sorry. It's Dontaku, fair enough. They should be a bit bigger. But, like... I just... I don't think that... Especially... I know they're doing so many of them. Um, I, I guess especially because they're doing so many of them. Does everyone have to work every night? Like, why not even just alternate the cards a little bit? And just have a th- you know two thirds of the matches or or even just half of the matches like if if these shows were an hour or an hour and a half, an hour and a half is even pushing it if they could cut them down to an hour, and I really think they could for just like the row two shows because they're not because that doesn't include the promos, just an hour of wrestling. And then you got, you know, your 20 minutes, half an hour of promos that you can watch afterwards as well. I think that'd be so much better. It just, look, as someone that watches all of these, there's not, you're not, I don't, like, there's, there's not, it's not a benefit. It's just overexposing these guys, I think. I think a, a match like um, Doki, Zack, and Taichi versus... Um, Tamatongo, Tangaloa, and Jado, that's a fun trios match. That you know, that could be for the title. You know, obviously Doki and Jado are a step back, but uh, a step below. But they've got a fun little kind of dynamic between them. And Doki's just fun to watch against anyone. I just think they're watering down this stuff. There's too much going on. I mean we already knew that, but just even if you have to do it even if you have to do a show four times a week just chop them down. I really didn't miss the... I mean, not that I didn't want to see Okada again, but I really didn't miss that match. And I wouldn't have missed if you had to cut 
Um, oh, I tell you what, cut to Gucci, Yano, Tanahashi versus Togo, even White. Cut that out. And, you know, this is a solid card with a great main event. I just think that's... Uh, I mean, it's a little bit boxing, isn't it? Just having just a few matches just to warm you up. Um, but the real main event that everyone came to see is at the top, and that's when you know that's when half the viewers actually turn the thing on. Um, but I think that's fine. If it's a big show, fair enough. Have a, a few bigger matches on it. But yeah, I don't know. I think that's um, something for them to look at. New Japan is to mix up the way they book the shows it's um yeah just very very repetitive but um i didn't mean to finish on a down note uh it was a great match at the end of this um shingo takagi and will osprey like i said I'll, i'll probably watch it again i try to keep track of all the best matches that i watch and then if I have time at the end of the year, I can just go back and watch all of them again. Um, plus it helps when, you know, there's people on Reddit or ever, when anywhere else say, hey, I'm a new fan, what should I watch? And you can just kind of go to your notes and be like, bang, 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 bang. Check these ones out. But um, anyway, uh, this is going on long enough. Thank you very much for listening. Look out for the new historical podcast coming out. 2007's a a great year. A lot of fun stuff happens. I think we're about halfway through it so far. Um, That's right, the last one. No, I think the next... I don't know what the last one I put up was. I think we're about halfway through. So, in any case, look out for those. And thank you for listening. And until next time, have a good one.